So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let's start the second half of our intermeeting of today. And this is uh, yeah, a half uh, day poli uh, trade policy day because it's not the uh, totally discussion of one day. But nevertheless, it's totally interesting to discuss a little bit the general direction of trade policy of today uh, because uh, trade is now faced with a quite changed world uh, regarding the pandemic, regarding the geopolitical developments we are faced with, with the United States, with China, with other emerging countries, um, and of course regarding also some, let's say, protective uh, thinking uh, uh, coming out uh, of, of, of the dark in, in several countries. So the environment of trade policy has indeed Change and therefore we have um, established two panels uh, for today. One is more the general uh, question of where trade policy is going uh, ahead in, in a time of uh, economic transformation and geopolitical instability. And uh, the second is uh, more on the question of sustainable recovery and the supply chain. So uh, I guess really, really important uh, a question to deal with besides our day-by-day -day work. And I'm really happy to have really experts uh, here with me to give an input and have a discussion with, with you, my uh, dear colleagues. Sabine Weyand, the Director General from DG Trade. Welcome, Sabine and uh, the uh, Deputy Director General of the WTO, Ambassador Jean-Marie Pogam. Also, welcome. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And hopefully on screen, it's uh, Mr. Rob Davis, the former Minister of Trade of South Africa, who should also be with us. It is working. With Mr. Davis? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, then we can start the discussion. And um, yeah, I will start with Sabine, with you. Um, what's your opinion of uh, trade policy in the context of geopolitical instability and uh, how we shall, should go on? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, trade policy half day. <laughs> we are trying to make best use of it. Um, and indeed, I wanted to uh, focus in my introductory remarks on two points. What are the reasons for the changes we see in the world around us? And then indeed, the more interesting question, how are we going to deal with them? Um, so th what are the major developments that are responsible for the changing environment for international trade? Well, first of all, economic. Obviously, we have the COVID uh, uh, crisis and the supply chain disruptions that that has brought. The crisis has exposed the interconnectedness of our supply chains, as well as the risks, but also the benefits associated with the international division of labor. The crisis has hit uh, economies hard and has required unprecedented government interventions to keep jobs and support companies. However, the means uh, to support recovery are very unevenly distributed around the world, and that will be a challenge as we try to grow out of the crisis. And from that point of view, the uh, COVID crisis has exacerbated long-term trends that we have seen before in systemic challenges, such as a general trend towards protectionism, towards an inward-looking approach, a breakdown of international cooperation, in this context, the weaponization of trade um, and this against the backdrop of a race for hegemony uh, between uh, the United States and China, which is a battle for political as well as economic and technological leadership. And all this has contributed to geopolitical uh, uh, um, tensions and this is combined with mega trends such as uh, digitalization and rapid technological advances, climate change and demographic shifts. This changing environment has several implications. As I said, the weaponization of trade, 
a growing need for uh, uh, autonomous tools, growing regional competition and rivalry for FTA. And we have to make sure that Europe holds its own in that geopolitical race. So how do we tackle this? That is the more interesting question, obviously. Mm. I think the only way to ensure stability and predictability in the long run is to find a new consensus for coexistence with different countries having different economic systems around the world. And for this, the WTO is key. Now, as we have Jean-Marie Pogam with us, I will be telegraphic uh, 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 on, on this part, uh, but you all know that this is the number one priority in our new trade policy uh, strategy. Rules-based trade is in the interest of everybody. Not only is, is, is power-based trade uh, particularly unfair to the smaller countries, but it makes it costly to enforce rules even for the bigger players, as I think the US have learned at their cost in uh, their uh, confrontation with uh, China. Because you need to escalate every small trade conflict into a political or geopolitical confrontation. And if you then respond with tariffs, well, you hit your own uh, economic operators and your own citizens with that. So it is absolutely critical uh, that we get a meaningful reform going uh, for the WTO um, and we need to have uh, some meaningful deliverables agreed uh, in order for MC12 uh, to set us on a pathway uh, towards recovery of the multilateral trading system. I will just mention uh, as the most important ones trade and health uh, as well as the fishery subsidies negotiations. Uh, it remains very challenging. Um, and we will have to see uh, what else is, is uh, able to be developed. There are a few uh, plurilateral initiatives uh, that are also promising. I'm sure Jean-Marie will talk about also what's happening on the environmental sustainability side. So I will keep my uh, remaining, few remaining speaking points uh, to focus on our bilateral and regional trade agenda, because we need to be present in the different regions around the world in order to uh, shape globalization uh, in line with our values and interests. Our trade agreements are important platforms for that. And I would invite you, if you haven't done so yet, to look at our implementation and enforcement report of the end of October, which shows that FTAs work. And that is something which is not sufficiently brought out in the discussion. Our free trade agreements deliver for our objectives. And I think that needs to be talked about a lot more so that we do not have theological debates about what we do uh, with our bilateral trade relations, but that we look at what works in practice. Um, finally, and I think the chairman has already alluded to that, we obviously also need to develop a set of autonomous tools to allow us to act when our openness is abused or in areas where we need to protect the integrity of our policies but where we cannot do that through negotiation. So, in terms of the uh, anti-abuse uh, toolbox, I would refer to the International Procurement Instrument, which I think is uh, uh, progressing finally quite nicely, the Foreign Subsidies Instrument uh, that is on your table, the upcoming Anti-Coercion Instrument that is part of that effort, in addition, obviously, to our traditional trade defence instruments. But also on the sustainability side, we will come with legislation on deforestation, which should alleviate our bilateral agenda of the burden to try and deal with every environmental issue under the sun. So if we are able to say we have a proposal that prohibits the placing on the market of uh, products derived from deforestation or forced labour, to uh, mention another issue, then we do not depend on negotiating this with a sanctions-based approach in our bilateral trade agreements, and we can actually use our FTAs for what they do best. They are platforms of cooperation and engagement. Because if we really want to make an impact on sustainability, then we will have uh, uh, to effect change in third countries. But show me the government or the national parliament that is ready to go for deep-seated change as a reaction to external pressure. That doesn't work. If you have a cooperative approach, it's a total diff totally different debate you're having. So I think we need to see uh, how best to use our FTAs in this universe of multilateral action, but also autonomous action, uh, because let's keep in mind, we are not alone in this world. 
and the rest of the world is not necessarily waiting for us until we have sorted out our internal complexities. And every day that we are unable to engage with the rest of the world, other players with other values and other ideas about shaping globalization make inroads, including in regions where traditionally the EU has been very strong. So I think we need to keep that in mind, and I will close with this plea uh, for a trade policy that allows the EU to be an active geopolitical player. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Clear message. What is the WTO saying on that? I'm pleased to have the Deputy Director here with me. Please, five, six minutes for you. Thank you, Chairman, and um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman, I'd like to, to, to put in perspective what is going to happen at our next ministerial by taking, picking up the two words which are in, in the title of this session, uh, both uh, geopolitical instability and economic transformation. As regard the, uh, I'll start with the geopolitical instability, where I think that the role of the WTO is to, to provide some, what economists would call an automatic stabilizer, and to a certain extent, I think we can report that it is playing this role quite positively. Uh, the organization has been extremely challenged in the, in the recent years by uh, several um, geopolitically introduced trade wars first. Of course, the most visible, US and China, US and EU to some extent, uh, but also uh, other ones like uh, Russia, Ukraine, or um, including Saudi Arabia, Qatar, which uh, have been in invoking the national security in, ter in, in the terms of trade. E even the Venezuelan crisis has been uh, spilling some waves in, in the WTO. So that was one. Second, of course, the challenge was about the uh, geopolitical turmoil associated with uh, COVID. Uh, the calls, of course, were not political, but the, the effects, lockdown, disruption, the value chains, logistical troubles, were quite comparable. And the impact of all this has been a deglobalization chain materialized by three, uh, in three big effects. The first one was uh, raising the cost of trade, uh, direct effect, uh, of course the tariffs, for instance. The second one was uh, raising the uncertainty for uh, exporters and investors in terms of decision making. That's probably the biggest macroeconomic one. And the third one has been the lasting effect, which is this rising concern about strategic autonomy, uh, which is something which has been uh, debated here in, in the European Union, but is de being debated all over the world. For instance, it is uh, a big uh, element of discussion in the free trade area in, uh, in in Africa. How did the WTO and the system react to that? I think not so bad in my view, given the complexity of it. The system has resisted the trade wars, uh, not without casualties, of course, uh, the appellate body uh, of the WTO being the, the biggest one. Uh, but no country left the system, trade retaliation have not generalized, and some tension has been reduced, uh, for instance, the one uh, which were recently solved, probably thanks to Sabine, in the transatlantic row over steel and aluminium. I think uh, this system has also supported the world economy during the crisis, uh, the COVID crisis. It prevented uh, sanitary nationalism to worsen the crisis, and it helped kept keeping the, the value chains open. It is now supporting trade recovery, as we see through our monitorings, uh, that uh, the trade restrictive measures which have been taken at the beginning of the pandemic are being withdrawn uh, in support of the uh, trade recovery. So uh, here we are with the geopolitical uh, instability. It's a part of our uh, system life now. The system may have been a little bit dented, but uh, it's still real life in the wake of our uh, ministerial. What proved more challenging is the second term of your, of your question, which is uh, the system as an enabler of economic transformation. And here, the difficulties that we have faced even before the trade wars and all that are still uh, quite uh, present in our discussion. Uh, I would like to, to address them through three challenges, as this is one way of doing it. Uh, the first one is about uh, leveling the playing field in the old economy. When I say old economy, I'm not being... Uh, negative at all. I'm talking about agriculture, where we know that there is uh, 
uh, now 25 years of ongoing negotiation about domestic subsidies, which are very, very uh, difficult. Um, and industry, of course, where we know that the uh, subsidies instrument of the WTO is quite uh, rudimentary compared to some uh, state aid regimes, such as in the EU or uh, other, or other countries, and is not helping enough to uh, conciliate the difference of systems that Madame Veillon was referring to at this stage. Uh, and this probably helps, uh, it has a role in fueling some anti-trade trends, such as the aggressive mobilization of trade defense instruments everywhere in the world, and uh, government pro procurement restrictions. So level playing field is one. Second challenge is about supporting what I would call the dual transformation of the economy uh, towards the economy uh, of the future, and these are uh, decarbonation and digitalization. And here we, we, we face some gap in the WTO between those who want new rules and those who do not want any, any new rules before the old ones are, are being rebalanced or, or, or precise. And as a consequence, this transformation challenge is being more and more dealt at uh, a dual speed, uh, at, with two speeds. The first one is a plurilateral dynamic, which is pretty forward-looking, especially on digitalization, but also on environment. The second one is more polarized. Uh, it's a multilateral dynamic, uh, as we can see with one apparently technical debate, which is a debate about the moratorium on um, electronic transa transactions that some countries uh, <clears throat> would not want to, to, to pursue a, in the future, or at least are, are questioning. Third challenge is clearly about integrating sustainable development into trade policy. Um, traditionally, trade policy has been only concentrating on growth, uh, without taking into account the externalities of growth. Uh, the political demand uh, that we face now are uh, different, and they are about mainstreaming this consideration of externalities in the design of trade policy itself. That has to do with trade and health, uh, trade and climate change, and other issues, including uh, social ones. If the WTO uh, cannot cope with, and it's difficult, it cannot cope with this uh, demand, uh, the risk is marginalization. Because if uh, history proves one thing, is that uh, what is not discussed inside the WTO happens outside of the WTO, uh, be it through private standards, unilateral or bilateral uh, policies. So that is a real um, challenge. So this is a context, uh, Mr. Chairman, in which we are preparing for our ministerial conference by the end of the month. Um, the stakes of this conference will not be to solve all these unsolved problems, of course. We are just barely recovering from all the geopolitical instability. But the WTO needs to provide clear signals that it can move forward and stay relevant. Signals on uh, sustainability or, or, or what our DG, Dr. Okonjo Iweala, would call uh, trade, showing that trade works for the people. Uh, that is, means fisheries, where 350 million people are living on, uh, around the world. Trade and health, as mentioned by Madame Veillon. Uh, agriculture and food security, which is also a very big uh, item. And it also signals on the future of the economy, decarbonation. I think we will have good news with some multilateral initiatives, which for the first time are going to tackle the issue of, uh, at least put on the agenda, the issue of climate change and other uh, issues like circular economy. Digitalization is working quite well in the negotiation on electronic commerce. Inclusiveness is also part of the, uh, of the discussion. I think I have to stop here, out of time, but uh, happy to answer any question that you have. Thank you, Chairman. Perfect. And now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Davis from South Africa, please. Mr. Davis Robe, please press on the speak button. Mr. Davis Robe. Thank you. Um, I said uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation. Um, I want to start by highlighting what I think are two. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you lower the camera a little bit so the interpreters can see your your? That would be yeah. perfect. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. So I'm saying thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity. Um, I want to start by mentioning what I think are two very important uh, global contextual issues which are of uh, extreme importance for countries in what's called the Global South. 
Uh, the first of these is the uh, COVID crisis, uh, the health emergency, but also the socioeconomic impact that this has had. And I want to make the point that apart from the uh, destruction of jobs, uh, livelihoods and uh, um, living standards across the globe, uh, there's also been uh, during this period an exacerbation of the inequalities and I would also say inequities uh, in the uh, global system. And they have been manifest in the withholding of supplies of uh, PPE and other medical equipment early on in the emergency and later this was exacerbated by the very, very great inequities in the distribution of vaccines, what was called by many people uh, vaccine apartheid. Secondly, uh, we've seen that in the recovery that's been underway, uh, while um, many developed countries have been deploying huge resources, uh, estimated by UNCTAD at between 20 and 25 percent of their GDPs to support a recovery, uh, the poorest, least developed countries have been spending less than 1 percent of their much smaller uh, GDPs. And this has led UNCTAD to again use a, a South African expression uh, to suggest that what we might be seeing uh, is a, a separate development. Uh, uh, and a separate recovery from uh, the uh, COVID crisis. The second uh, point I want to make is that uh, the outcomes, I think, from the Glasgow COP26, whether or not they uh, leave it aside the question whether or not they actually save the world from catastrophic climate change, are likely to result in an accelerated transition to a lower carbon economy. Uh, an accelerated transition which will have disruptive effects in countries across the world and probably quite significant disruptive effects at that. Uh, so there was a study done in my own country, South Africa, which said that the Paris commitments that we made, uh, which have been improved in, the, uh, uh, in our COP submissions, uh, COP26 submissions, uh, would uh, result in the decommissioning of assets uh, worth about 60% of our GDP, and that's not talking about jobs, it's not talking about uh, communities uh, affected. And I make both these points because I think that if we are to move into a world which is in any sense uh, more inclusive uh, than uh, the one which we are in at the moment, uh, one where I'm suggesting that the disparities are widening rather than narrowing, uh, what we're going to have to see is what uh, our uh, theme is talking about, transformation. And I would say radical transformation in the productive structures and in the division of labor that characterizes the world economy. So I think immediately arising from the, the vaccine situation and the PPE situation, the, this has emphasized the vulnerabilities for many countries which are uh, reflected by the reality that they are not producers uh, of these products, that we are dependent on uh, imports of these products from, from uh, small uh, numbers of producers across the world. And it uh, speaks to the necessity to diversify uh, locations of production of many, many uh, forms of health and other uh, emergency equipment. Secondly, the transition to a, a lower carbon economy, if it's in any sense going to be just, is going to have to mean that the developing world is going to have to have a chance to become producers and not just consumers of uh, green technologies and, pre and green products uh, that are produced uh, in other countries. We are going to have to become manufacturers and producers of those products. Now, um, what does all this mean for, for trade policy? Well, I think if we look at the, at the period of globalization from the 1980s to about 2008, or as an uh, increasing number of writers are calling this hyper-globalization, uh, I think while it, it's the case that uh, millions of people were, living out of, uh, were lifted out of poverty during this time, most of those who were lifted out of poverty were lifted out of poverty in countries which were making transitions to more diversified economies and towards higher value added production. Uh, and most of those uh, were uh, located in one country in particular, in China. And if we look at the, uh, at, at the trade policy that was pursued by that country and others like it, it's very much the same as the trade policy which was pursued by all earlier industrializers. Their trade policy was strategic. It was 
calibrated according to their industrial policy. And it was asymmetrical in two senses. It was asymmetrical in that they took advantage of opening up to, to their products in export markets, but they did not liberalize and open up their own markets at the same pace. And secondly, they opened up and liberalized their own markets at a faster pace as they became more industrialized and more competitive. And I think this points to this, the key lesson of economic history, that if we are going to achieve a more just world, we need to seek a transformation in which many more countries are going to have an opportunity to diversify and to move into higher value added product, products. And if you're doing this and you are industrializing and you are diversified, then participation in international trade is, of course, a benefit in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, uh, industrial capacity uh, and, in co and in terms of incomes. But if, on the other hand, you are remain located in the global division of labor, in the position that colonialism consigned most of us to, producers and exporters of primary products, and perhaps add to that assemblers of some sort. If that's your position in the global division of labor, then you can find that international trade uh, is for you what UNCTAD again has called trading more and earning less. Because as technology is changing, as uh, higher digital technologies are coming in, the, the value of the raw material in the final product is a smaller and smaller part of the final product. So the issue is not whether we are in or out of global value chains. We are in value chains, most of us. We are in value chains. The, the, the real question is where are we located? If you are merely the producers and exporters of primary products, that is the least lucrative place to be. And I think the problem that we've had, as Danny Roderick of the Harvard University has, uh, has pointed out, is that for all practical purposes in the past, integration into, into value chains has become a, a substitute for a developmental policy. So we need uh, a developmental strategy uh, that is around, and we need trade policy and trade rules and other rules uh, that support that. So what does all this mean? I think it means that, first of all, that one-size-fits-all models in which all of us are told to take the same rules and in which there's little differentiation between us uh, is uh, inappropriate uh, to a world which needs uh, greater inclusivity and greater development. We need, in fact, more flexibility and more diversification in terms of the rules and more respect for the aspirations, uh, particularly of people uh, in the uh, as yet uh, underdeveloped world. And so I think that the big debate around the multilateral trading system, not necessarily that will be on the agenda at MC12, because I don't think that the, uh, the, 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 that the uh, situation is right for that discussion, but the reform of the, of the world trading system uh, is not a simple one-way street in which the demands of, uh, of some are going to shape it. Many of us have been calling for a reform for inclusivity and development, which has got to have a number of components in it. First of all, and fundamentally, it's got to respect the, 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 the policy space required for countries to industrialize, diversify, move into the higher places in value added uh, in value chains. It's got to clarify and respect and strengthen uh, the special and differential treatment uh, rules and provisions, and it's got to apply that S and D flexibly uh, uh, in, a, in a way uh, that supports development and, in, and, and diversification. It's got to support and respect uh, the uh, emergence of value chains uh, in, in, in the southern parts of the world. And here I'm thinking of something like the African continental free trade area, uh, where most of us who are looking at this closely are seeing its real prize, not as being that it will just increase interregional trade between us, but it will actually support the emergence of regional value chains, including uh, those in the pharmaceutical industry and those uh, producing uh, green technologies. It must be a system that's going to apply flexibility in the application of intellectual property rules in a context where we, I think we've seen that intellectual property is not just a reward for innovation. It's also gone much further and is a license in a number of instances for monopoly conduct. Uh, we've got to uh, 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 look uh, closely at that and immediately, I think, uh, to uh, approve and support uh, a waiver uh, for uh, the production uh, on a more diversified scale of uh, COVID vaccines and other uh, important uh, health emergency equipment. It would help 
if uh, mode four was seen as a way in which developing countries could provide services uh, across uh, uh, important global markets. And of course, the uh, long outstanding issue of agricultural trade reform, so that the developing countries uh, that have an inherent comparative advantage in the production of many agricultural products uh, could realize these. So I think these are some of the items uh, that, that, that they need to be part of, a, of an agenda of transformation uh, in order uh, for us to, 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 to navigate through this uh, complicated global environment in a way uh, that promotes greater inclusivity and allows the developing countries of the world and the peoples of the world uh, to benefit uh, from the structural changes uh, that are already underway. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Rob. And uh, now we switch to my members here and give them the floor for two minutes each to comment or raise another point as they like, or criticize one of the speakers. Um, Danuta Hübner is the first. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, everybody. I would like to ask uh, some questions about plurilateralism, because I, I think it's, uh, these arrangements are seen as a very useful vehicle for some issues, for the most difficult, for future-oriented, uh, or to test some solutions. So as long as they remain open, we believe that they are a good mechanism. But, of course, plurilateralism is not multilateralism, which WTO has been uh, just committed to, uh, and it was established uh, to be a multilateral. Um, institutions. So my question actually to, uh, to Madame Veyant is uh, how far can we go with this plurilateralism? Um, because this is a very pragmatic approach in reality. When you talk to US, uh, they don't see the future. They don't talk about the future after MC12 of the WTO, but they talk about some kind of plurilateral arrangement. So th th there is also disappointment probably from other countries who joined WTO because of, it, of it, its multilateral organization. And also to Mr. Davies in, in this context, your inclusiveness in the reform of WTO WTO, how do you see that plurilateralism would work uh, for it? And to, to Mr. Jean-Marie Pogam, I, I, I understand that um, uh, the WTO Committee on Trade and Environment is, is basically doing most of the things they are doing are plurilateral agreements. And uh, uh, my, uh, my understanding is also the WTO will, will look into moving on towards a global carbon price, uh, which by definition should be, I think, today a multilateral uh, agreement. So my, my uh, question on this is exactly how do you see it? And, and can also, do you see WTO as a leading institution for, for this whole process or liaising with other uh, multilateral organizations of the world to, to do it uh, together? And the second question to you, Mr. Pogam, is related to the steel and aluminium because steel and aluminium deal between Europe and the US is about TRQs and it's not about removing the measures entirely. So uh, do you see it as a part of general tendency to, to leave uh, the era of trade liberalization and entering the one of managed trade? Is there a risk also in such solutions? Thank Thanks a lot. Kathleen Fabrem, also two minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I would like to, um, first of all, make a, an overall political comment, and I would like to know whether the three intervenients um, have a do agree on that um, is that, of course, I agree with the, the general analysis that we need a new geopolitical way of looking um, at um, uh, our trade. But in that sense, it is extremely important that we drop the silos within Europe and that what we do in trade is going exactly in the same direction if what is what we do in, in, in foreign policy and in our geopolitical uh, views on that. And in that sense, I do see a few problems. And I just want to outline two that Three of you also uh, mentioned one way or the other. The first is, of course, on, on <clears throat> the unequal um, distribution of the vaccination. We've had lengthy discussions and we had a vote this morning again on it. Uh, and I would like to say to Mr. Davis that he has the support of the European Parliament when it comes to uh, more equal uh, distribution production um, uh, and the TRIPS waiver. Um, and there you see 
That um, and that's also a question to Mr. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Pogam. Uh, do you eventually see a solution um, on that issue before MC12? Um, uh, and do you also see a way forward um, within a future pandemic treaty how trade uh, issues can be uh, can be uh, can be tackled on that? The second question is with regard to China and ta Taiwan. Of course, we have to deal geopolitically and trade-wise with China. But we should stick also very firmly to our principles that privileged relationships um, uh, go hand in hand with democracies, um, with the rule of law, for instance. Um, and also in this parliament, you will see, and, and there's also a democratic deficit growing here, um, that there's huge support um, for tighter trade relations and investment relations um, uh, with Taiwan. Um, uh, and my question to Mr. Davis um, and, and to Mr. Pogum um, is, is also to give um, some comment on that, uh, because I do know what Mrs. Wynand, Wynand thinks on that uh, issue. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Marie-Pierre Védren, for two minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci à nos trois panélistes pour uh, leurs interventions qui ont bien uh, dit que les relations commerciales, elles sont... Thank you. The three speakers that uh, the trade relations are being affected, but that the EU has a role to play to make sure that trade rules-based trade is defended. Now, last year we saw a turning point that we saluted to find the balance between opening openness and uh, trade-based rules. We have to work on the multilateral level as well as the bilateral level and the proper and autonomous in instruments of the EU. We've got to be daring in the WTO and make daring reforms. And I don't think that we will reach these objectives by next December because the big point of concern is China. We have to work with our American ally and those who have that ambition so that the rules can change and evolve. But when we define rules, there's the challenge of applying and enforcing the rules. And one of the challenges of the WTO is the reform of the blocking of the appeals body. Now, in the WTO, the U.S. and China must take their responsibilities. But how in the MC12 can the director general, how is she going to tackle that subject so that we can uh, come to some kind of solution? And then our bilateral agreements and the EU's role. You can see that, and our colleague uh, uh, raised this point. It's the kind of the consistency of our policies and ways to allure the, allay fears of our citizens. Now, in applying the rules... Well, the Parliament has been pushing the European Commission to set up uh, an instrument to aim uh, uh, to fight against coercive measures. Does extraterritoriality is that going to be included in the scope of application? Or will there be a wide, uh, extended, and extensive panel? And how will we do this? Zastia Brickman. Merci, merci à toutes et tous pour vous. Thank you for all your very interesting contributions and very complimentary, sometimes a little bit contradictory. It's interesting to see that our views are not necessarily the same uh, when we speak of to certain statements. This is a very key, key turning point, a political turning point uh, coming out of a pandemic from which I think many of us learned a lot of lessons and the transition is not going to uh, come by force. We're in the middle of COP26 and there's some urgent issues. If, if the Commission could tell us that climate change uh, is not just one dimension to consider, but it's a key element to look in our trade policies because of the con climatic consequences. And what about biodiversity? I haven't heard any mention of di biodiversity within the trade policies. At least the Commission hasn't referred to that. So, Mrs. Wyon, I'd like to speak to you. Commissioner Dombrowski said he'd like to set up a coalition of ministers, trade ministers, kind of a climate club. Could you elucidate on that? Uh, is this pretty much in line with G7 and G20 declarations? The fact of putting sustainability into the WTO's realm of work. Could you tell us what the state of play is? Could this climate 
Climate Club become a center of dialogue to solve some of the problems mentioned here, including the issue of the TRIPS waiver for the vaccines. Uh, Mr. Pogum, uh, your will to uh, include the sustainability issue in the WTO's work. Now, how do you think that this will take place? Would we have to clarify Article 20? Would there be structured questions with respect to environmental and tr trade sustainability? Uh, and do you think for MC12 you could come up with something of that effect? Uh, do we have a kind of a rendezvous or a clause for MC13? Oman Haila. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the panelists, though I don't necessarily share everything they say. Things are not quite the way we thought in the summer. If you look at the effect of the lockdowns in the member states and the coronavirus numbers, uh, there are particular problems. The auto industry is suffering. Uh, the shortage of chips is a problem, and there is a threat of uh, insolvency. Uh, the rise in commodity prices is a problem. I could list all sorts of uh, things. And, and I'm not uh, necessarily a, a protectionist, but I have to say that just in time, uh, the just in time economy is reaching its limits. So, what can we do in the EU to make our economy more resistant, resistant to external shocks and geopolitical tensions? The Central Committee is meeting in China at this moment, and it looks as though China is going to continue to uh, distance itself from the West. The resolution they're going to adopt uh, is not in line with um, our thinking, and they are thinking in terms of uh, deeper communist ideology and surveillance. And this is going to have effects on our exporters, our direct investment. And it's not going to be possible for China to continue to play the role of Europe's extended workbench. In conclusion, we have to improve cooperation with partners who are interested in rules-based free trade. And that's obviously not China. And then Gerd Bosch, about two minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, panelists. I have two questions for Madame Weyant. Uh, I think we agree that uh, trade is not a problem, but trade is, the, is part of the solution. So this Commission has the ambition to be a global player, to be a global actor. And there are three levels, as you said. We need multilateral action, and I hope for deliverable on MC12. Second, there are the autonomous measures, the, the autonomous tools. But third, we need more free trade agreements. And uh, as you said, free trade agreements uh, deliver. They are delivering. But my question is, is this commission delivering? We are midterm now. We, until now, we only have the free trade agreement on Vietnam. Uh, I, can you uh, give us a positive answer that uh, in the second half time we will have more free trade agreements, uh, we have the autonomous measures and so um, if you want to be a global actor I really think we need more free trade agreements for our growth, for our innovation, uh, for stability, for geopolitical reasons, uh, not letting the, the space to illiberal uh, regimes and so on. My second question is, um, what is the Commission's concrete follow-up uh, to the forecast report identifying critical and vulnerable supply chains? Is there sufficient alignment with the new industrial policy? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Helmut Scholz, two minutes. Thank you, Chair, and I want to thank all the three speakers for the very interesting 
introductory remarks, as I would say, because we are starting a discussion or we are continuing a discussion we always have. And my question would go into the direction, do we really already recognize the narrative about what we have to speak and how we have to invent and to, to continue to, to strengthen a multilateral, rules-based trading system? Um, the elephant in the room was already mentioned by several colleagues of mine, China and the Chinese challenges on the world economy. And I see, of course, the, the interlinkage between the production lines, the value chains in this international frame. But uh, I also see the growing distance between the different actors. And we had just been recently in the US, and I had the chance to report to, to our um, interlocutors there about my interpretation of that. And I'm coming back to the narrative. If the narrative is a climate change, if the narrative is a food security, is overcoming poverty, etc., can we allow ourselves to continue to invent the trading system as it is now? And that leads me to the question to Mr. Davies. We had in the 70s and 80s of the last century a huge debate in the UNCTAD concerning the new economic order, world order, reflecting the block system in the world. And if we are today putting ourselves in, again in a rivalry, should we then maybe take some ideas from that time when trade, economic cooperation, commercial cooperation was a tool to overcome the political blocking? And I, I hope that um, the work in the WTO is used in the way that we are giving new answers. And maybe that is also the question to uh, Mrs. Weyand and, and Mr. Porgum. How do you see the chances that we are coming to such a new definition of the narrative in our trade policies and also in the developed countries? Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for a sharp one-minute interventions. Anybody? Mr. Andrews. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I just have one very sharp question, if I may. Um, I, I think if we are running into obstacles in free trade agreements, um, one of the things, of course, is the transparency of the negotiation process. And the, one of the characteristics of the negotiation process around the trade and cooperation agreement was a constant feedback loop from the chief negotiator, not just to member states, but to the European Parliament. And it smoothed the way for the eventual ratification, albeit under a provisional application. And my question is, is, is would you agree with that characterization of the uh, European Parliament involvement with the negotiations on the, on the TCA as being slightly in advance of the norm? And if you do see that as a good model, do you think it's something that could be replicated in, in negotiations in order to smooth the way to future free trade agreements? Thank you. Julius, bring it up. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you for the speakers, for the excellent presentations. Uh, several questions have been raised by my colleagues about China, and I would just add one little element to those questions on China, uh, directed, of course, to our Director General of DG Trade. Uh, you said that uh, it's not the external pressure but the cooperative approach which should be favoured and I'm deeply agreeing, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, one uh, one uh, uh, internal question, we hear about the, possible of, the possibility of the EU-China summit before the end of the year. Could you confirm something like this? Do we, we have... We have We'll have a, a new China summit, summit before the end of the year, and if yes, then uh, then uh, on the bullet points of our uh, of our uh, EU uh, uh, representatives will be the question of lifting the sanctions uh, towards the European Parliament. Thank you. And last one is Ima Rodriguez. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just to conclude, I'd like to know what the uh, how we're going, we know that the development of sustainable trade is important and of course there's the uh, rate of uh, uh, carbon and then the recent WTO declarations 
uh, don't give enough uh, uh, impetus. How can we make sure that uh, all of these countries comply with the trade norms and standards? Oh, uh, now I will uh, take the opposite order and start um, with uh, uh, Rob Davis. Seven minutes sharp. Rob, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks uh, for, I think, uh, um, a very interesting uh, set of questions. I won't ask, uh, try to answer them all in uh, order, but just uh, pick up some uh, key themes. I think that uh, a number of people have spoken about uh, the issue of uh, China. Um, let me just uh, jump in by saying that I think that we have moved from uh, the unipolar world that came into existence at the end of the Cold War uh, into a world which is much more multipolar uh, and that uh, China's development and industrialization over the, these decades uh, has really propelled it into a very important and significant place uh, in the, in the world order. Uh, and I think that it's uh, very likely that in such a, a transition uh, that there will be a huge number of adjustment and political issues and value issues that will arise. Uh, and I think that the, the real risks to me is that we could end up, rather than moving into a world which is more multipolar and indeed which is more multilateral, uh, that we could end up in a world which is characterized by block formation and I think that would be to the detriment of any kind of uh, inclusivity. So I think that uh, what I would want to say and caution against is the idea that we weaponize a whole lot of political issues, be they Taiwan, be they any other thing that you, you might uh, uh, want to mention at a political level, that these are weaponized uh, in, in, in trade rules and things of that sort. And I think we've seen an episode of that. Uh, a number of the calls for reform of the global uh, order. We're predicated on the fact that uh, China, which had at one stage been held out as the great poster child for uh, its uh, really remarkable economic transformation during those years, uh, suddenly became the villain. Uh, and all of the, uh, the, 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 the steps that it had taken and the tools that it had used were now demonized. And were, it was said that uh, rules uh, must be uh, put in place uh, to try to discipline and curtail China. Now, the problem with that is that they were also applying not just to China, but were cutting off the possibilities of any of the rest of us applying any kind of successful industrial policy in the future. They were blocking the, the, the possibility that any of us that are not yet industrialized, and indeed some of us which have undergone premature deindustrialization as a result of some of the policies that were introduced in the, uh, in the period of the 90s, uh, that we could uh, in fact uh, move into higher value added activities and diversify. And I think that's the real problem. And so that if we move into a multipolar world, I think that some of the sentiments that were, were expressed by, by, by Madam Weyand, uh, that uh, there needs to be much more recognition of diversity and that there needs to be uh, more of the, the recognition of uh, the different needs of different countries and groups of countries uh, and peoples within countries, I think is an important one. And that gets to the, the question of the, the new international economic order, which I think one of the things that was characterized in that was a recognition precisely of that diversity and the need to, to uh, allow uh, different countries to choose their own routes to development. But there's not a one-size-fits-all model. There's not a ready reckoner of policies that must be applied uh, from um, Alaska to, uh, you know, to, to Zambia. Uh, and everybody follows the same set of basic rules, macroeconomic rules in particular, uh, trade liberalization and so on. Uh, I think that we need to move away from that. And that's why uh, a number of us have been calling for reform because we don't think the status quo is 
is, is, is what we want to defend. Yes, we want multilateral rules, but we want a reform of the multilateral rules system and a reform that is expe explicitly aimed at inclusivity and, and development. And then on the question of, of plurilaterals, uh, let me say that, uh, you know, um, I think that if uh, groups of countries go off and they form ISPs on different subjects uh, and only some are involved in that, that doesn't mean that uh, whatever's agreed in those ISPs is going to be the outcome in terms of any multilateral rule uh, on that particular subject. Uh, so um, I think that needs to be well understood. Uh, if it ever comes to the table in the WTO, uh, it will be subject to the inputs of the entire membership. And so I think that uh, the the, 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 the way that the, the, the things are seen as, as uh, a substitute, uh, you can't get your way in the, in the, in the WTO itself, so uh, you know, the formation of ISPs is seen as some sort of substitute. I don't think that is actually the, the, the route that, that, that will prevail and, and that these will be uh, uh, particularly uh, sustainable. Um, let me say on, on, on uh, issues of, of the environment, I've already said I think that this transition is going to be pretty significant uh, for, for, for all of us, uh, necessarily so, um, and that uh, we, 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 I think, need to avoid a situation in which um, uh, through trade rules or, or, or other actions, uh, we, we, we move outside of the framework of common but differentiated responsibilities, uh, which is agreed in the uh, UN climate change process. I think that uh, if there are any um, issues around um, you know, uh, uh, carbon taxes, border adjustments and things like that, those have to emerge there. They shouldn't be unilateral actions. Uh, if they are, I think that it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to risk uh, being selective, it's going to risk uh, being uh, unfair to countries uh, which are already undergoing uh, uh, pretty uh, significant uh, 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 challenges uh, as, as they move uh, further forward. Um, I'm very pleased uh, that, um, as uh, Ms. Uh, uh, van Brent uh, indicated, uh, that the Parliament has agreed uh, that, the, that the TRIPS waiver should be engaged with. Uh, I do hope that this can be something that uh, does uh, uh, lead to a, a speedy conclusion. And I'm mindful of the fact that the, uh, the TRIPS and public health uh, process that was agreed in Doha in 2001, uh, it took something like six years before a fairly watered down version of what was uh, signalled uh, at the Doha Ministerial uh, finally emerged. So I do hope that if uh, we are now going to engage in text-based negotiations, uh, that there is a, a, a will to find a solution that will allow a greater diversification of production uh, of uh, medical equipment and uh, particularly vaccines uh, across, uh, across the world. Um, I think those were probably most of the issues that were directed at me, so let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Mm, Ambassador Program. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, all the questions. Uh, I'll try to, to, to address a little bit more in detail the question of sustainability and climate change because it has been raised by uh, several of you, Madam, namely Madam Abner, Madam Bretmo, Madam Rodriguez and Mr. Scholz on the, the, the narrative issue. Uh, and then the other one more rapidly. On this question, uh, what happened is that for uh, since inception, the WTO has not been able really to do more than talking about the environment. And climate change was not even an issue that was being dealt with in the WTO. Uh, I have been chairing the Committee on Trade and Environment for one year. It was not possible to put climate change on the agenda uh, just for talks because some countries would not, uh, would not want that. Now, the things are changing very rapidly now due to uh, three factors, I think. The first one is an initiative uh, called Trade and uh, Sustainable Development Structure Discussion, which is a plurilateral initiative, which is going to be uh, formally adopted at MC12, uh, which wants to deal with all 
I mean, several trade and, and uh, environment issues, but including climate change. I think one of the big uh, events of uh, last week was that uh, the EU always was uh, an engine of this initiative, but China and the United States have been showing this initiative last year, which gives to it a lot of traction, and that is a first game uh, changer. The second one, obviously, is CBAM, uh, which has been uh, observed with a, a lot of uh, questions in, in the WTO. These questions have been uh, starting, and it leads to uh, answering the question which was uh, raised about how do we see carbon pricing. Um, I think it's very clear from a WTO perspective, my DG has been extremely clear uh, on that, but other economic agencies have been that the first best solution for everyone would be uh, global carbon pricing, which does not necessarily mean single carbon pricing. The issue is about having a price on carbon everywhere in the world. So uh, economic agencies have to work on, uh, on this point, and I think we are ready to do it. Now, in the meanwhile, uh, there will be probably several other uh, approaches to that, some regionals and some unilateral, CIMBAM being uh, a unilateral one. Uh, how do we look at that? There is uh, absolutely no reason in principle why the WTO uh, could not be compatible with an initiative like CIBAM. And having looked at it uh, in terms of uh, the preliminary ideas which have been coming out of the Commission, and we are aware that the trilogue will have to take place, so the, the end of the game is not necessarily here. Uh, we think that CBAM is quite well sought to be compatible with the um, uh, WTO. There are several legal routes that I would spare uh, now, but I mean, one is non-discrimination, and this is the one which has been chosen by the uh, EU Commission. It's probably the most difficult one legally, and probably the most efficient one economically, so it has to be worked out in details. What from a WTO secretary perspective, we say is uh, to our members, please come and talk, please come and discuss. This is, we are the place where you should discuss that, try to check the devil in the details, rather than go first to litigation. That's a choice which is uh, within our members' uh, hand, but we are very positive that it can be uh, discussed positively and constructively in the WTO. The third major force which is playing a role is businesses. And uh, I was in Glasgow last week, and I can certify that I felt a, a, a sea change in the last two years in the business's attitude to um, uh, decarbonation and, uh, uh, and low carbon transition. They all have plans and objectives. And this is something that I would uh, like to, to, to stress on, uh, answering partly uh, the question raised by uh, Minister Davis, because it's true that all these um, policies may have a, a complex impact on, uh, on developing countries and uh, a just transition needs to be uh, sought through. But since businesses are doing it, uh, I think what we have to think very quickly is about trade facilitation. Because what the businesses are doing now, they are setting their own objectives and they are asking their suppliers in international supply chain to comply with that. So some producers in developing countries will have to certify one day that they are carbon free, the net zero, if they want to export to uh, other markets. So there is an issue also of cooperative approach which can be which has to be discussed here if we do not want um, most vulnerable countries to be uh, mar uh, marginalized. So I'm very positive that the dynamic is on uh, in, in, the, in the WTO in terms of integrating the decarbonation uh, issue. So, sorry to be so long, but there were four questions on, on this. Now, on the other question, the question of the bilateral deal between uh, Madame, Madame Ibner, between US and, uh, and EU and still, uh, we have, maybe we, we did not think about it a, a enough, but we have no reason to see it as a systemic uh, move. We, we, we welcome it happily at the resolution of a trade war, which is, of course, uh, very positive, uh, and no other uh, conclusions uh, at this stage. Uh, on the um, question of Madame Brent, I think on uh, the solution for vaccine, we really uh, hope so. Uh, we welcome the EU very active uh, engagement, both in the General Council of the EU, uh, to, to try to 
propose clarification and uh, discussions about the TRIPS flexibilities. We take note, of course, of the vote which has been taken place today at the EU Parliament and we'll monitor uh, what the EU uh, approach will be in the future. There is still a chance where, that we... Um, uh, we can work a solution which would be, of course, one of the important outcomes that we would uh, hope for at, uh, at the MC12. Regarding uh, Taiwan, which is uh, called Chinese Taipei, exactly in the WTO, uh, for, for us it's not really an issue because uh, Chinese Taipei is a member of the WTO, so it, has, it enjoys the rights of all members of the WTO um, in terms of uh, interaction with us. Uh, la question de Madame Vedren concernant... On the question by Ms. Vedren on the appellate body, the problem is that everybody apart from one is in favour of the, uh, an efficient appellate body. The US haven't given many indications on this debate. Catherine Tyler, the negotiator of the US, has indicated that she, they are interested in the discussion. Now, the issue is about launching or relaunching dialogue. The EU has done a great deal when you look at the initial position and the current position. I think this will help to relaunch negotiations. So we do hope that we'll be able to move forward the with the reform of the WTO. Now, on narrative on climate change, uh, sorry, I should have said that I, I really believe that the climate change narrative can be integ fully integrated into trade policy because that's what business wants. C carbon pricing is not an academic issue. It's something which is demanded by businesses to, to, to be able to uh, invest in the decarbonation. And I think uh, I did not forget any question. If I did so. Perfect. Thanks there. a lot. And Sabine, seven minutes sharp. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, uh, start off where, where Jean-Marie Pogam ended, and that is on the narrative question. And here I would like to borrow a phrase from Mr. Davis. Okay. Um, so I would also like to start with the narrative, and Mr. Davis allows me, I would like to borrow his phrase uh, of uh, uh, aiming for a reform for inclusivity because that is exactly what we need. Um, and that is what we have to put on the agenda of MC12. If you look at the Marrakesh Declaration, uh, even, I mean, if you look at GUT 47, it was a very forward-looking uh, uh, approach, which was talking about the harmonious development uh, and allowing for different stages of development to be, to be recognized. What we have to recognize, though, is that something went wrong in the WTO because this uh, reform for inclusivity or inclusivity or development became synonymous with special and differentiated treatment, which in turn became synonymous with a carve-out of uh, developing countries from any rules disciplines. And the effect of that was that it neutralized the impact of developing countries in negotiations because if rules are negotiated and it is clear that you get a carve-out from the beginning, your influence to shape these rules is close to nil. So we really have to have a different approach to inclusivity in the WTO. What we are trying to do is to have a discussion, therefore, uh, to set up a reform working group at the WTO, which covers all three functions of the WTO, but we also, which is negotiation, monitoring, dispute settlement, and we found that that was a way which was more persuasive for the Americans to come on board. Uh, we hope to see some more clarity on that. But what we also need is a conversation about a common sense of purpose of the WTO, because that has been lost. So we also need to create the space to have that debate, what is the WTO for? And I think this is not so much just a, a, a function or a role for the WTO secretariat. The members have to come to this new common sense of purpose. And I think there we need to look totally differently at the development question and not uh, look at special and differentiated treatment as something that uh, basically gives a carve out. Because if the rules are there to promote development, then it cannot be right that a carve out is the response to the development needs. Then something's wrong with the, need, with the rules. So we really need to go about this in a different manner. In, in this context, I have also fully subscribed to the objective that we have to have a more 
a diversified way of organizing the international division of labor. But let's make no mistake, without an international division of labor, we will not be able to meet our climate objectives. If we do not have an international division of labor where everyone can play their full role in accordance with their comparative advantage, where we share technologies, goods and services that are necessary for the transition we are seeking, we will fail because we will not be able to afford that transition. So we need international economic division of labor and cooperation and trade agreements in order to make that possible. Um, in this context, what does plurilateralism mean? And uh, Mrs. Subner rightly referred to some people uh, mentioning plurilateralism without mentioning the WTO, and that really worries us. Because we think it's clear you cannot move forward with 164 countries at every step, because then you are not going anywhere. So plurilateralism in the WTO is what enhanced cooperation is in the EU. And the essential is that it must not detract from the rights or obligations of the non-participants, and it has to be open to participation by everyone, which is the reason why plurilaterals have to fulfill these objectives and have to remain anchored in the WTO. Because otherwise we risk having the block building that uh, uh, Mr. Davis referred to, and which I think is a real, uh, a real risk to the detriment of everybody. Now, um, on, the, on trade being part of a, a policy instrument mix, I would agree with that, but... I think it works in different directions. Yes, trade policy has to put sustainability and notably climate change center. But, and we are adding provisions on biodiversity also to our trade agreements. But we have just had a COP on biodiversity. And I'm sorry if the international community in international negotiations is not able to land on binding commitments with monitoring and enforceability. Don't ask trade agreements to uh, fill that gap because that doesn't work. We cannot replace international uh, climate diplomacy, international environmental agreements by trade agreements. They have to be mutually supportive. And as I said, that is what we are trying to achieve. But we also need to look at how others are going about that. And I come to the question by Mr. Winkler on China. It's not only a cooperative approach, it's also a cooperative approach. But we need to look at what the US is doing. I don't like everything of it, but they show that it is perfectly possible to have a cooperative approach on certain issues where it suits them, it is in the American interest, like we should have it on the issues we dealt with in CHI, where it is in our interest to address these issues while standing firm on human rights and on forced labor through autonomous instruments. But do not ask trade agreements to deal with everything. There has to be consistency and coherence, but we have to use our global sanctions regime and we have to use our, uh, uh, we have to use our forthcoming instrument on forced labor. We have to use our forthcoming instrument on deforestation. But, I mean, the only consequence of having trade agreements solve every problem under the sun on its own is that the boat will sink. And then we lose out economically, socially, and environmentally. That cannot be the, uh, the objective. Um, so on the dis uh, distribution of production uh, and a better, uh, a fairer division of, of production, that is also what should guide us on the discussion on uh, trade and health, which we are sponsoring and, and leading very much in the WTO, including on the TRIPS waiver. And we are engaged in constructive discussions with, for instance, South Africa, because South Africa is very interested, exactly, to be an attractive place for investment and to protect the cooperations that have been launched, for instance, by, uh, with BioNTech Pfizer and uh, a, a South African company. So we are engaged in constructive discussions there. We need to make sure that in what we are doing, we are not undermining the incentive and the attractiveness of countries like South Africa, but also others, as an investment place. So it, there is no easy solution there. We are not there yet, but I think we are one of very few delegations that are actively trying to get to a result by MC12. MC12 will not be the end point of that. We will, this will have to continue because there's also a question of preparedness uh, for the next uh, uh, pandemic. Um, on, I'm, I'm not sure I have answered all the questions. Uh, just on the climate, uh, uh, on the club of trade ministers for climate, I think uh, Mr. Dombrovskis has taken his inspiration here from the existing club of finance ministers for climate. We will come back to you with more detail on this, so we will play this in full 
uh, transparency uh, 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 with the European Parliament. Um, and uh, I think I will stop here. Uh, I'm aware that I haven't answered anything. I am happy to come back uh, bilaterally or in a, in a future meeting. I think I have more opportunities to talk uh, to you than some of the other panelists. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you a lot to all the panelists. And indeed, the discussion is not over, just a starting point. And Sabine, yeah, you're quite right. We have the chance <laughs> to meet again in several occasions. Thanks a lot. This was the first round. It's more the situation as it is at the moment, the different possibilities in the change geopolitical situation. Now, the second panel is more based on the scientific reflection how trade policy can be part of the sustainable recovery uh, in the next year, so for the, for the perspective 2030. And the first introduction speak uh, will come from uh, Professor Joe Spolwein from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, Geneva, for five minutes, please. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair. I hope you can hear me well from um, cloudy Geneva here. Uh, I would like to use my five introductory minutes um, to, to basically do three things. Uh, people ask me to speak a little bit about rules-based trade, how I see the, the future of 2030. Summarizing a bit what we've already heard, I want to just say uh, a few words on two mega trends that I see as challenging international trade. The second thing I want to do is to give some ideas on how the EU can respond to these mega trends. And the third thing I want to do is more concretely talk a bit about what a different rules-based trade system could look like in 2030. So very briefly, the two mega trends, and, and we've heard already a lot of talk on this, but I would put them in two buckets. The, the first bucket is a return of ideological value battles. I graduated, I started my uh, career in the 1990s, and then um, Francis Fukuyama's book on the end of history was all the talk of the town. Now, what we see today is, is really a revenge of history, uh, deep value-based divisions between countries. Many people have mentioned China, but even between like-minded countries like uh, the US and the EU, we see that on certain things we agree, but on others there's big divergences, like on data or climate change. And if you have that diversity, it, it's really hard to make deals. It will be issue by issue, sector by sector, country by country. And as I think Ms. Van Blent was saying, we have spillovers from trade into all kinds of other areas, forced labor, human rights, climate change, geopolitics, technological battles. So it complicates the picture. Second mega trend is stress or breaking up of multilateralism and rules-based trade and a return of narrow self-interest. Now, I think Ms. Houghton will talk about this, but what I mean with this is not just um, the US invoking national security or killing off the WTO appellate body, but also pandemic and vaccine nationalism. Uh, the EU screening foreign direct investment for national security reasons, a general challenge to WTO rules-based trade. Uh, if we all look at our own self-interest first, and there's nothing wrong with that per se, it becomes a lot more difficult to take collective action, and there'll be a lot more pressure to deviate from the rules. So that's my, my first point, the, the two megatrends. How could we react to this? How could the EU react to this? Now, you will think I'm a, an academic and international lawyer sitting here in Geneva that I will be pleading for an unmitigated return to multilateralism and the old appellate body system, my view is actually quite different. It's way more nuanced. Um, first of all, I think we have to just accept and be happy with the fact that the EU is, is large, is a powerful actor, and even without rules, the EU would survive offensively, defensively. The EU has the power to negotiate deals. The steel deal is a good recent example. It has the market to, to retaliate, to enact unilateral instruments. And some rules flexibility at some point may be useful to push certain recovery agendas. I'm thinking of uh, climate change and the CBAM, the issue of data transfers, industrial policy. And 
honestly, I think it's a very positive development that the EU has been more assertive and, and putting forward what they call these autonomous instruments. So that, that's one side of the picture, which I think is a powerful development of, of tools. Now, on the other hand, many have stressed it, and, and I'm completely on board with this, even a powerful country, a powerful entity like the EU, needs or benefits from, from rules. Um, even large players benefit from rules in that you can hold other large players accountable. You need rules as the EU to deal with the US, with, with China. Plus, and I think Ms. Catella will speak to this, businesses, workers need predictability. Even if you're a powerful player, playing only power games is very unpredictable for your business. So rules is good to tie the hands of other powerful players. Plus, it's just good for you, even if you're a big player, for your companies, the predictability of, of your industries. So my, my main point here is that we need to find the sweet spot, a combination between these unilateral autonomous tools where the EU can use its power, its market pressure, with a set of rules that we are all uh, bound by. Now, I'm also European. I'm from Belgium. What I often see is that we Europeans, we have rules too much in our DNA, and often we want to transpose the European Court of Justice model, for example, to something like the WTO appellate body, which I think is, is wrong-headed. So my last point, uh, Chair, more concretely, how could a different rules-based system be set up by 2030? I see three levels. At the WTO level, many have mentioned it, the rules need to be reformed. They were created when there was hardly an internet, right? Secondly, on dispute settlement, I think we have to give up on the idea of resurrecting the old appellate body. It's not coming back. Instead, let's talk basics. What is the system for? What do we want to achieve? Rules-based trade can happen without a WTO appellate body. Even the U.S. is behind enforcement, but of a different type. Look at the USMCA, look at how they are pushing for dispute settlement and the OECD tax deal. Secondly, EU free trade agreements need to continue. It's a very powerful tool. And I think there we need to move from state to state uh, confrontation, focusing more on the firm level enforcement. The USMCA is a good model. Uh, facility-specific labor enforcement, for example, or what the U.S. is doing on forced labor, these are withhold and release orders, or what Europe is planning to do in terms of due diligence and imposing it directly on companies. The third level is unilateral instruments, autonomous instruments. And I think there, there's a lot in the works that I think is very positive. CBAM, foreign subsidies, using the GSP system. Um, all of this, even though it's unilateral autonomous, it can still be rules-based in line with WTO rules and in line with solid rational thinking rather than protectionism. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor. Next, uh, Ariane Schuten, researcher at Knowledge Ecology International from Washington, D.C. Please, five minutes. Um, Madam Schuten Ariana, please press on the speak button. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Knowledge Ecology International is a not-for-profit NGO that searches for better outcomes within the management of knowledge resources. And one action that the European Union could take as an equitable solution at present is to act in support of the TRIPS waiver. Um, as you may know, the waiver would only suspend obligations to abide by the WTO TRIPS rules and be limited to one virus for a specified period of time. And without prejudice to other relevant and important provisions in the waiver, certain essential provisions are the unconditional waiving of Article 31F and 39, in addition to not being limited to a specific set of countermeasures, for example, not only being limited to vaccines. So Article 31F limits compulsory licensing to uses which are predominantly for the supply of the domestic market. So this provision effectively operates as an export restriction because it limits exports to less than 50% of what could be produced nationally. And Article 39 relates to manufacturing know-how and regulatory data. 
And the unconditional waiver of this article would allow governments to have flexibility in sharing know-how and data to scale manufacturing capacity, and it would absolve uncertainties surrounding the enforcement of data exclusivity. Another action EU member states could take immediately um, is provide additional resources to CTAP, the COVID technology access pool, much like Spain, who recently just contributed 1 million euros. And looking towards the future, uh, KEI welcomes the EU support of a pandemic treaty. But in order to have a sustainable and equitable outcome, the treaty needs to support new global norms to address equity, strengthen health systems and the resilience. And these provisions of the treaty should be based on equity, solidarity, transparency, and also international cooperation. And I'll briefly discuss certain aspects of how the proposed treaty should regulate intellectual property, know-how, and medical technology. So the treaty should create global norms to ensure and enhance both pre-pandemic and crisis-related funding for research and development. So this would not be a global fund, but it would allow members to meet research and development funding norms through a variety of arrangements, such as investing in national R&D programs, global initiatives, or other commitments. The treaty could also establish norms on conditions and norms for binding licensing provisions when there is government-funded research and development. So there could be open access or open licensing with specific incentives to share. And this is particularly important because exclusivity doesn't allow the quick scalability of manufacturing in order to tackle um, a crisis of pandemic proportions. On the topic of technology transfer, um, t that technology transfer should be a norm during a pandemic and not an exception. And this norm could be implemented through specific obligations for states to impose conditions on R&D contracts, or when it involves private financing, to engage with technology transfer through mandates or specific incentives. The pandemic treaty should also mandate sharing of rights in innovations, data, access to know-how, biologic resources. Since experience throughout COVID-19 has shown that voluntary measures are currently insufficient. Specific to regulatory standards, the pandemic treaty should address some of the key challenges around clear reporting, inconsistent approval standards of emergency use provisions, which potentially had an impact on vaccine hesitancy, the triggering of sharing of confidential information, but also test data, which is needed for regulatory approvals. And the pandemic treaty should have an ambitious section on transparency to address um, a variety of transparency goals and standards which are relevant to a global and equitable pandemic response. This could be um, transparency on R&D costs, manufacturing capacity, information on pathogens and clinical trial designs. But overall, the structure of this treaty should be something that's dynamic and builds over time. It could have multiple levels of harmonization uh, with compulsory provisions, opt-in provisions and soft norms. But overall, the sustainable and equitable solution for this pandemic and future potential pandemics cannot rest only on voluntary measures or generosity through donations. But a new model, such as a pandemic treaty, is needed to recover and avoid ongoing injustices. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And the last intervention is coming from Eleonora Catella, the Deputy Director, International Relations from Business Europe. Also five minutes, please. Madam, please press on the speak button. Can you hear me fine? Uh, no, unfortunately, no. Can we refresh your connection and you'll be back in like 20 seconds? Yes.
Madam, please press on the speak button. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, it is better than before. Thank you. Perfect, but we have, this is what the test identified as the best one. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at the hearing. Thank you for the invitation. I will uh, address the topic of disruptions in supply chains from a um, business uh, perspective. Well, as you know, companies have increasingly organized their uh, uh, production processes across uh, uh, global value chains in an attempt to optimize these production processes. Processes. But this also comes with uh, challenges as uh, uh, COVID has uh, painfully exposed. And this has led us all to ask uh, ourselves some questions. Uh, are there still benefits in global value chains? Should we rather relocate production to Europe and become less uh, dependent on external suppliers? Uh, how to make uh, supply chains more resilient. This has, all, uh, has also been a question that uh, one of the MEPs has raised just earlier. And Business Europe, uh, to answer these questions, uh, has uh, created a dedicated task force, and we have conducted a survey this summer uh, with our member federations and companies uh, so that we can provide uh, a business input also to some of the legislative, uh, to, to the debate around some of the legislative uh, initiatives uh, um, now. So that uh, it's also a question of strategy, the strategy on how to be create uh, open strategic autonomy. So here today I will share the preliminary results of this survey, but then Business Europe in the next weeks will come with uh, um, policy recommendations and an official presentation, presentation of these policy recommendations. So now I will talk about three things. The first is the short-term and long-term challenges that businesses have uh, faced following COVID. The second is what companies have uh, started doing and are planning to do in the coming years to face these challenges, to address these challenges. And the third point is uh, some preliminary suggestions that I can share with you today. So the first point is uh, the difference between short-term and long-term challenges, because the short-term challenges are in principle temporary and directly linked to the pandemic. And uh, they, they are those that we all know. So the shortages in raw materials, uh, increase in costs, uh, increased, uh, increase in transportation costs, uh, um, and, and so on. But the, 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 the trickier part and what is it more interesting for today is the long-term challenges because these are not uh, directly linked to the, to, the, to the pandemic. Let's say they were realities already present and they have been exacerbated by the, by the pandemic. So it's trends that are unfortunately um, going to stay. What are the main ones? The first is export restrictions. We have seen it with uh, medical supplies, uh, and now we are seeing it with raw materials. The second is localization requirements. Even if you take the, the, the example of the United States with public procurement, we see more and more local content requirements, uh, and this is a challenge for European companies. Uh, and this is also a challenge uh, when it comes to, to, to data and localization requirements on, on data. The third challenge is measures that merge uh, security, foreign and economic policy objectives. And a fourth challenge I want to mention today is the fragmentation of uh, standards and regulations. So what have companies started doing? Of course, uh, diversification strategies uh, to source from different uh, suppliers, uh, increasing their stocks, uh, moving so to from a just-in-time to a just-in-case kind of approach um, on, on stocks. They have improved the lead times and they are trying to in increase the transparency over their supply chain so that they can plan better. But the point is that there is only so much that companies can do uh, and uh, we need uh, there are other areas that are independent from companies. There we need uh, pol public action. So here is the third and last part of uh, my intervention with uh, four uh, suggestions. The first is the elimination of uh, export restrictions. 
We need to ensure that European producers have access to the critical inputs they need for uh, production of their, of their goods. The second point, the second suggestion is uh, uh, not to confuse resilience with the protectionism. We must absolutely um, create the right environment uh, for business in Europe, uh, continue to be an attractive place for investment and uh, think of the European competitiveness. So we need to keep trade flows going because this is what makes companies resilient and we need to create a level playing field because we cannot be harmed as European producers by competitors that are advantaged in an unfair way by foreign subsidies, for example. Um, finally, no, third, third suggestion, sorry, is we need a comprehensive approach across all the policy instruments we can come up with. We need a comprehensive and consistent approach of a trade policy, industrial policy and digital policy. Otherwise, we won't be able to realize the digital and green transformations and we won't achieve open strategic autonomy. Fourth and final suggestion is we need to coordinate with like-minded partners. So it's very good what we are doing at the bilateral level on supply chains, actually, uh, within the context of the EU-US uh, Trade and Technology Council, but we should do that also with, uh, with others. And also we... With others, we need to think of international standards, promote those, uh, and address the fragmentation uh, on standards. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Now to my members. Julio Winkler, two minutes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you for those uh, uh, presentations. Very valuable. And I would uh, just uh, point out uh, very interesting something that... Uh, that I find very typical for our debates lately, since we debate the recovery and the post-pandemic world. Uh, Professor Paulin, he says that he sees ideological uh, value battles. And uh, as I understood, those ideological value battles are something that are not linked to economy and even are, are painful to economy. And then uh, uh, Eleonora Catella says that she wants a level playing field. Uh, or she proposes, businesses propose a level playing field, and uh, I, I, I uh, wonder if those two things are compatible. I wonder if uh, uh, technological neutrality is something, and this would be my question, technological neutrality would be something that is desirable. Uh, we need something like this, or even when uh, we are... Uh, uh, debating nuclear energy in Europe, is that an ideological battle for me? Yes, it is an ideological battle. Uh, is it technological neutrality when we say zero emissions in uh, uh, mobility and transport? Because if we say decrease, uh, if we say zero emissions, then we pick out only and one only specific technology and no others, because there is only one technology for mobility, which is zero, uh, zero emissions. So my, uh, my question uh, comes, and of course I'm thinking about as a is I'm thinking about successful recovery uh, and, uh, and uh, maintaining or regaining a new type of competitiveness for SMEs as for, and for the European industries. And my question is, uh, what about those ideological battles? And uh, do we need or not uh, technological neutrality? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Perfect. Thanks a lot. Margarita Marques, two minutes. Muito obrigada, Presidente, por falar português uh, e começo exatamente por uh, agradecer uh, ao Bern, agradecer ao Presidente. Thank you. I'd like to thank the panel and the chairman for the fact that uh, we have this uh, trade policy debate. Firstly, on the general principles mentioned by Adriana Schutten. Information sharing, research are important aspects which should be followed up and there should be binding principles which uh, include uh, access to information and access to personal data. There is 
a broad consensus on the idea that the EU values to do with human rights and sustainability are upheld by a trade policy. And this can be seen in the Commission's stance on trade. Trade policy, environment policy and values have to be interlinked. It's important for the EU, therefore, for trade policy to be designed in such a way that everything is included in FIT for 50. This is important from the point of view of promoting a level playing field in the EU and creating incentives for third states to reduce their carbon use because we want uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. My question is addressed to the representative of Business Europe. Does a balance need to be struck in the EU between climate policy on the one hand and ensuring that the goals in climate policy can actually be reached? And there are technical, political and diplomatic aspects to this, but perhaps you can you say something about this. So we end with two minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I want to uh, just note that Mr. Paulin um, very accurately described the balance that needs to be struck uh, between assertiveness and uh, openness uh, and that I think is captured very well in our trade policy review in which I was a shadow rapporteur. Um, I think he captures the tension that is there as well. I want to pick up on one uh, point that he raised which was about due diligence. Uh, the Commission is soon to publish a uh, proposal uh, that will, uh, a, a legislative proposal on mandatory due diligence, which aims to address violations of human rights and e environmental degradation in the supply chain. Uh, and in addition, um, President von der Leyen recently announced an import ban on goods that have been made with forced labour. So I'd la like to ask Mr. Powell to uh, elaborate on his thoughts on how this can, uh, and how this can work and how it can help and how urgent this uh, needs to be. Secondly, uh, Ms. Schoutenham gave us her thoughts on where a pandemic treaty should be. And I think that we in this committee have consistently called for um, a different global governance on the procurement, uh, the production and distribution of vaccines. Uh, what we've seen has completely undermined uh, our own credibility in terms of equitable distribution of vaccines and solidarity with others in the World Trade Organization, indeed the World Health Organization. Um, but is she concerned that like any member state uh, a global body like the World Health Organization, like the International Health Regulations, the World Health Assembly, it can be so uh, disparate as to be completely ineffective? Um, and does she see that a compulsory license is, uh, if it is the outcome of the discussions that are going on at the moment, will come compulsory licenses have an impact on vaccine availability. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Saskia Brigmore, two minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et à nos invités pour leurs interventions. Le, le, le titre de... Thank you very much, Chairman, and to all of the speakers. The issue is how we prepare for 2030. This is about reducing... Uh, CO2 emissions by 55%. It also means, uh, by, by having more FTAs, it means having more emissions. There's also a clear impact if we look at these studies in Parliament. This relates to biodiversity. Now, obviously, when we talk about uh, sustainable recovery,
when we look at economic, we when it looks like uh, when we look at operationalization, and I'd like our guests to speak to this here, it would be how to put the sustainable goals for trade policies and put the, the heart of these policies. Look how successful our FB, FDAs have been, not just for growth and GDPs, but actually achieving aims of sustainable development by considering our carbon footprints and looking at our trade uh, relations, basing them on the population's welfare. Uh, we've heard about trade issues based on rules. Uh, some of them are defective today because there's an increase of e inequalities, uh, overexploitation of the Earth's resources. So these rules like due diligence, the directive on the deforestation, forced labor, the reform of GSPs that we discussed this morning, climate aspects at the European level and WTO, all these reforms are a step in the right direction. But if they are to be effective, we've got to make them enforceable. As, as Mr. Pobonet mentioned this, I'd like your opinion on that and, and on the binding aspect of the sustainable development trap chapter of the trade agreements. Could we uh, be able to achieve this? Could we get civil society more involved in the uh, steps where we verify that our agreements have been applied? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank uh, to the panelists also for their interventions. I have a question for Professor Paul and I will address him in Dutch, which is uh, his and my uh, mother tongue. So, Professor, um, I will it have over the appellate body die nu alle hele tijd te lam ligt. Um. I want to say something about this appellate uh, body. which for some time has been defunct. The idea is to have a multilateral dispute settlement system. And in particular, I want to tackle the criticism of this body. Do you share this criticism? What could be done to help? Where is the problem? Is it that the rules are not uh, properly adapted to e-commerce and other modern forms of trade? And is it a problem that uh, the uh, cases take uh, too long to resolve? What are the reasons for that? Do you share the criticism? Do you think there is scope for finding a solution? And if so, what? Should we forget about this body and go for a, multilater a different multilateral system? Thank you, Chair. I also want to thank the three speakers for, for the as they express the look into the future, how we have shaped this, this trading system. And that leads me again to the question, how we can make achieving the SDGs a real benchmark in the international trade policy system, but also as a benchmark for the trade policy carried out by the European Union or other partners in this world trading system. Um, so, and, and we have spoken in the morning about the CBAM here in the committee. And we, we learned from the Commission that the introduction and the implementation for the first 10 years, we are arriving in the year 2034 before we knowing if this CBAM will really work. So I question the three experts, what does the time factor mean for readdressing certain tools, instruments we are trying to invent to, to promote the current, the today's understanding of trade policies, but we have to accelerate the whole process from my point of view. So how we achieve then common and joint answers given by all WTO members, the different levels and the different stages they are, to, to give a concrete commitment 
to introduce it. Because otherwise we have, have, will have the next trade policy day and then again we are speaking about this issue. So how far you see the ability to, to accelerate the process with, with the knowledge of your today in uh, introducing new tools or um, making the new tools we are inventing practical and effective? Thank you. I thought two short further intervention. Uh, Ima Rodriguez, Pinheiro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, actually, uh, it's good that we've had this debate on the implementation of trade agreements uh, and voting on our resolution of the WTO, and it's a great that we've had this hearing. And I'd like to ask two of the panelists, well, the, both of them, all three of them, in there, uh, I'd like to say what will we do in the next MC of the WTO where we will take a lot of time to achieve agreements that will save multilateralism and the WTO. We approved a resolution which gained ample support. Hopefully it will gain that in the plenary where we actually set our priorities. Now, the, for Business Europe, and the academy and the NGO. What are the aspects uh, that should come out in approving this uh, aspect? Thank you, Chair. I have two concrete questions. Um, first to Professor Paulen. I think you said quite explicitly that you think there will, the return, there will be no return of the old appellate body, so it will not come back, and I'm not a specialist as you are, but I so more or less have the same feeling. But what will, what will be the alternative? What sort of uh, enforcement, including a sort of appeal, will be possible in, uh, in your view? And to uh, Mrs. Ariana Schouten, um, also thank you for your comp contribution. I was wondering whether you have the ideas that you outlined, you have them on paper, because I think it's very interesting for this parliament and especially this committee to prepare ourselves for the pandemic treaty. And my question is, you, you argue strongly um, for a compulsory technology transfer and data transfer during a pandemic. Um, and it seems very logical to me to put that in a pandemic treaty. Is that possible to do that without um, changing the TRIPS agreement um, in the content. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So I give back the floor to the panelists for four minutes each. Sharp. Ms. Catella, please. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for the questions. I will start maybe with uh, um, the question by Ms. Marquez. Does a balance need to be struck between climate policy and ensure that our objectives can be reached. Of course, there is a question here between desirability and uh, feasibility. We need to be effective, otherwise uh, it's, uh, it, it is a bit pointless. So we need to think of what is effective to uh, produce a change uh, on the ground to achieve results. So I think that there is no silver bullet here. We need to use all the instruments at our disposal, thinking of uh, uh, trade policy as far as it can go and, uh, uh, and, and uh, trade policy in a multilateral uh, environment, in a multilateral context, uh, at the bilateral level and autonomous measures, so all the three levels uh, as it has been mentioned by, by previous speakers, and also in other fora. Here we need to use also the, uh, the, 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 the UN fora, for example, and multilateral uh, uh, environmental agreements. So we can't really overload the trade agreements. We can use uh, trade agreements, though, and sustainable development chapters uh, to, uh, to a certain extent, to uh, this, the extent until where they are effective. Because, for example, a TSD chapter can have... No, that has binding provisions and there is also a mechanism for enforcement already now. So it is, uh, uh, it provides the tools for discussing uh, issues with relevant partners and uh, this is already an incredibly good step. And to another question, uh, responding to Ms. Brickmont, can we have a civil society more involved? 
We are involved as civil society organizations, business Europeans, alongside with uh, trade unions, uh, environmental NGOs and others in, for example, monitoring that the commitments on sustainable development, also on climate change, even on the Paris Agreement now, are uh, really effectively uh, implemented by, by the parties. And we have uh, opportunities, we have the instruments and the right channels to uh, raise issues of implementations to the uh, two sides so that they can be uh, taken uh, taken up. So, um, uh, indeed, uh, we, have, uh, we have new tools. We have tools at our disposal. So we are also coming up with new uh, initiatives. And I think uh, I agree with Ms. Brickmont, they can be uh, very good uh, steps, uh, these reforms that we are um, coming up with uh, on uh, um, uh, supply chains, due diligence, uh, deforestation and so on. We need, uh, as I said earlier, we need consistency and a comprehensive approach though, so that uh, we have transparency, we have uh, um, a clear vision of what is expected of companies. Uh, and we need also a good understanding at the um, international level, level on the same definitions and what we need to achieve, because otherwise it becomes very difficult to, uh, to understand what is required where and companies need predictability and transparency of rules so that they can do their part. So we need clarity on a number of things. And on CBAM, for example, and these other initiatives, the first step to make these uh, uh, possible, to, to make these tools effective, is to communicate uh, very clearly with our trading partners what is the rationale behind what the EU is trying to achieve, because otherwise they risk to be misunderstood for protectionism, and this would be very, very counterproductive. So the first step is really to engage with others and explain, and of course, uh, ensure that these are WTO compatible and, and trying to engage others, starting with like-minded partners to, um, to share ideas and come up with initiatives, initially plurilateral, and then with the possibility to extend to, to all the others. So I think uh, also at the, at, the, uh, uh, at the next ministerial conference, what we expect is uh, to have this good dialogue and to uh, present initiatives and also to show that the WTO is uh, still the right place where to discuss issues and where to forge a consensus on new issues. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Ms. Schouten. Okay, I think my microphone is working. Uh, yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, on the aspect of compulsory licensing, um, as we know now with um, that um, the COVID-19 pandemic and effective countermeasures don't rely only on vaccines, um, but compulsory licensing um, is, and some of, the, some of the measures involved are essentially export restrictions. And these are something that we would clearly not want during a pandemic when we, when we want to respond with um, like increased scalability because any, any time lapse or any extra time it takes can have a direct impact on, on lives. Um, and the case against the, wa the waiver um, has come down to effectively the scaling up of vaccine manufacturing capacity. But that remains to be seen, of course, and many of the narratives about the futility of inducing entry into vaccine manufacturing are awkward given the surprising short-term entirely new vaccines have reached the market and the widespread use of emergency regulatory authorization, uh, amongst other things. And KEI really looks forward to trips and negotiations in a waiver that would offer real solutions uh, to removing all WTO-enforced intellectual property barriers at the moment. And just as a, as a side note, um, we've been, KEI has been working with Canada, who has um, their own um, implementation of Article 31 bis of the TRIPS agreement, and it's not even fit for purpose for COVID-19. So companies in Canada can't even make use of the compulsory licensing provisions because Canada won't allow COVID-19 pharmaceutical products or to be exported. So that's another additional thing to keep in mind. 
Um, and then there was another question um, on uh, data and transfer. And I think the, uh, with the WTO agreement and uh, as I said, um, for technology transfer, states could condition specific research and development contracts with technology transfer. So this could also happen when it's either publicly financed or privately financed. Um, but when this concerns um, potential overlap with the WTO or other trade agreements, um, such as the mandate, um, we could re require, for example, the use of the existing TRIPS flexibilities or the treaty could address um, the other t the, the WTO or other trade agreements. So this there doesn't necessarily have to be an overlap, but it could directly make address um, some of the existing treaties that exist within the pandemic treaty. Um, and Kath Kathleen, I, I would be KEI would be happy to distribute in writing their thoughts on uh, the pandemic treaty as I laid out today. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And the last four minutes to Just, Professor Just Paul Berlin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think three questions were directed uh, to me that I want to address. One by Mr. Winkler on level playing field. The second one by Mr. Andrews and uh, Ms. Brickmont on sustainability. And then the, the last issue raised by Mr. Bourgeois and uh, Kathleen van Bremt on, on the appellate body. Now, on the level playing field question, I think it's a very intriguing question. So, if I'm correct, and there's these ideological value battles, how can we ever level the playing field? Now, in the past, we always thought about, okay, we, we will somehow harmonize, or China will, 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 will adopt Western principles, and, and we will all follow international standards. I think someone mentioned it. I, I think we have to be realistic. Some of these differences will remain and we have to accept them. So we need to build a new model of interface coexistence. Not so much harmon harmonization, at best equivalence, recognition of equivalence, or basically trying to price differences in regulation or value structures. And I think here the EU-UK Brexit trade deal offers a very interesting example where the UK can adopt new environmental, social, labour subsidy uh, rules different from the EU. But if the UK does that, there may be a readjustment happening. The, the EU may impose tariffs to make up for that difference. I know it, it sounds very technical, but I think in principle, that's a very intriguing way to, to deal with ideological battles, differences between economies, and have a level playing field, not through harmonization, but by way of pricing these differences. And CBAM is in many ways the same thing. You, you accept differences, but then if you're the EU, you'll say, well, if you want to play in our market, if you want to sell in our market, you have to pay our carbon price. So you, you adjust differences by pricing them. Mr. Andrews and, and um, Ms. Brigmont raised questions on sustainability. And Mr. Andrews, I think, put it well, that the balance between assertiveness, tools, and, and rules uh, openness. Now, what I wanted to highlight, talking about the due diligence uh, trend, is that both in unilateral autonomous instruments and in free trade agreements, I think we have to move away from antagonism or disputes between states. Think of the EU dispute with Korea over ILO ratification or the dispute between Guatemala and the US over labor standards under trade agreements. The trend that I see is that instead states work together and they go at source and they find the company in Mexico that is not respecting the right for collective action or to unionize. And both states together with stakeholders will basically find that company, uh, push them to comply, and if they don't comply, to restrict their trade flows. So it becomes a, a firm level detection with the help of, of stakeholders, trade unions that can trigger these pr procedures. And then you, you actually make it a very cooperative process, but at the end of the ride, you still have the strong instrument of sanctions. You basically tell 
the Peruvian lumber producer that if if you are not complying with Peruvian deforestation laws, your wood will not enter into the US or the EU market. So that I think is a is a new model and is one that, that I think the, the the EU could learn quite a bit from the US on this. Ms. Brickmore mentioned the need to to revise the rules so that we can really work on sustainable development. I'm sitting here in Geneva, I will be very honest, to, to do that at the WTO level, to even mention forced labor, uh, environmental issues, it's very controversial. So to me, the more manageable way of doing this is to do it through your autonomous instruments, free trade agreements. And given that current WTO rules offer an enormous amount of flexibility to, to deal with forced labor, climate change, all of this, I think that should be the focus, not so much changing WTO rules on this on this issue, but rather finding autonomous instruments, free trade agreements that, that really work at the firm level. Now, lastly, on, on the appellate body, I, I try to be very frank, and, and I, I work both in Washington, where I'm a professor at Georgetown and here, so I spend a lot of time talking to my US colleagues. And, and yes, I think it's, it's a vain effort. It's actually counterproductive to keep putting this appointment of appellate body members on the agenda for the now 47th time, it will not happen. The US will not under the Trump administration nor under the Biden administration agree to restart the appellate body as it was. I think that's just imagination, it will not happen. Instead, as I was trying to explain, the EU has to sit down and think, okay, what is it that we want to get out of this WTO dispute settlement system? Rules-based, I think a red line has to be, it has to be binding and it has to be independent. But does it really need an appellate body as we saw it develop? I, I really question this. I'm not saying the appellate body did illegal things, got things completely wrong. It's just that they developed in one direction that is completely unacceptable to, I'll be honest, not just the United States. I think a growing number of WTO members including actually the EU, has openly said in a February 2021 report that they agree with a good number of the US critiques of the appellate body, some of the outcomes. So there's a growing sense in Geneva that this may be a good time after 25 years of operation to take stock. How did the system develop? Not just the appellate body, but also panels. And to realize, look, is it normal that these, these procedures take five years? that only, I don't know, a couple of dozens of lawyers, me included, and we have kind of a monopoly over this, understand what's going on, that you have 70% of panel reports appealed, that the appellate body reverses more than 80% of panels, and that in the end of the day, what you see is fewer cases filed, they take longer, countries are very disillusioned about it, don't see compliance. So to me, it's time to revise, rethink the whole system and to stop talking about reforming the appellate body or reenacting the appellate body, there's nothing wrong with taking time to revisit a system and, and to go back to basics. Now, what could it look like? If you look at all free trade agreements in the world that have binding dispute settlement, none of them have a second level of appeal. Must the WTO have it? I'm not sure. Um, if it has one, I think it could be way more deferential, that appeal system. And if anything, it, the system has to be leaner, faster, focusing on settling disputes, not on creating case law or developing new rules. As Ms. Mr. Bourgeois was saying, if the rules are not adapted, I don't think it's for judges to invent them or to make them evolve. It's for the members to do so. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for this, uh, let's say, putting the problem on the table. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I guess we will continue. So once again, thanks a lot to all the panelists and to the valuable um, input and uh, for this interesting discussion. This concludes point 11, point two, uh, 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 10, and point 11 is any other business, but there is nothing. And <laughs> Karin is not there. Yeah. And point 12, the next meeting is on the 29th of November. Have a good time. See you in the plenary.